As, as y'all know, I'm Henry Quillian here at Taylor English Duma, and uh, it came to my attention that we have a couple of new attorneys in the firm who uh, have not practiced before, and uh, that we have a whole staff of paralegals who uh, have various degrees of experience. And so I had this idea of doing this uh, session, which is something I actually did at my previous law firm, which is to try to work people through the rules of civil practice so that we're all familiar with not only what we need to do, but also why we're doing what we do, why forms have what they have, why it's important that forms have certain words in them rather than just trying to use a form, uh, and ultimately to uh, have the attorneys, older attorneys, and more experienced paralegals uh, teach the newer attorneys and par younger paralegals uh, civil practice, and then also to uh, establish best practices for the firm. So for instance, uh, there may be senior attorneys here that have an idea relating how something can be done much better in connection with something under the Civil Practice Act, and uh, we would want to adopt that if it the, makes the most sense for our cases. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on uh, is, and the other purpose of this seminar is to try to develop materials by which new lawyers not in the firm might uh, learn and these videos may well be posted on our website for that purpose. Uh, one of the rules we're going to establish today is that when I say when in doubt you are to say, read the rules. Uh, and if there's anything that uh, I want you to leave from this, this series of, of uh, seminars is that we all need to read the rules. When I prepared for this, I read the rules that we're going over today and all sorts of things popped out at me that I'd either forgotten or that were new and different or that all of a sudden I realized why such and such was in a document or not in a document. So when in doubt, Read the rules. Okay. Uh, we're going to focus on what's called courts of record in Georgia. And does anybody know what courts of rec what the courts are that are courts of record? Superior state magistrate. All right, we've got superior state and magistrate. Probate. Juvenile. I don't think they're courts of record. The only courts of records, to my knowledge, are state court, in other words, the state court of X county, or the superior court of X county, and then probate court, I believe, is a court of record only in certain counties where there's a large enough uh, population to fall under a court of record statute that says that the probate court is a court of record. And one of the things that the court of records have to have as a judge is somebody who is trained as a lawyer. lawyer. Uh, other courts don't necessarily have to have lawyers as their judges, which is highly problematic potentially. But uh, And so in the courts of record, the reason why we're focusing on that is the Civil Practice Act in Georgia, 9-11-1 uh, SEC is applies to courts of records. Now, the rules we're going to be looking at are the Civil Practice Act, the Uniform Superior Court Rules, the Uniform State Court Rules, which are really just slight modifications to the Uniform Superior Court Rules that apply to state courts, meaning courts that have the name the State Court of X County, and then also uh, any case law that might amend or clarify those rules and then also if the Constitution is involved with certain aspects of practice or the origin of the Civil Practice Act, we may touch on that. This is a basic nuts and bolts course. We are not going to be discussing a lot of theory in case law. Mainly if there's a case that says something that is very important, that is instructive as to why we do something. That's the type of thing I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to focus on the, con you know, the history of the Constitution, how it came about, and, and, and uh, why we have certain uh, rules. So this topic is uh, starting a lawsuit, and I've got, as we often have, a little hypothetical. Uh, Jane Smith comes into your office today. 
She claims that John Doe owes her $10,000 on a note that became due and payable five years, 364 days ago. It's 3 p.m. What do you do? Anybody got a... Uh, Make sure she understands that um, you are not representing her. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you... you no, know, yeah. <laughs> One additional fact. You're right across the street from the courthouse. What do you need to gather up to help Jane Smith? Retainer. I'm going to get your retainer. That's a practice tip for you out there. Um, Track show what, what was owed when whatever the person that she was supposedly dealing with signed showing that they actually borrowed that money from her. Okay, so you get a copy of the note. That would be helpful as a lawyer so you'll know you'll have a good faith case if you bring it, right? Let's assume she has the note and she has the demand letter that was sent uh, three weeks before saying pay me the money by yesterday or I'll sue you. Uh, what would you have to gather within your law office in order to commence a lawsuit? Which I might point out for those that you don't know, this is the day the statute of limitation runs. You want to make sure the courthouse across the street from you is the right courthouse to file it in, too. That would be true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, you have to make sure that it's an op it's open. It's not a holiday, right? So, right. Uh, and, uh, but if you were to pull it, go to your forms file or, or to your word processor, what sort of documents would you need in order to commence a lawsuit? Uh, Eric. Uh, well, since this is uh, $15,000 or under, you probably want to file this complaint in the magistrate court. And all you need is the magistrate complaint and the filing fee to do that. So you look for the Fulton County, the Fulton County Magistrate Court form complaint. Uh, you're, you're, this is Hey Hira, Georgia. There's no magistrate court. <laughs> uh, this is there's only state court and courts of record in this county. And uh, besides that, if there was a magistrate court, the closest one is 50 miles away. So we're in state court or superior court. What do you need? Complaint. Complaint. Some filing forms. Okay, so I hear complaint. Filing forms, summons. Filing fee. Filing fee. Filing fee. Filing fee. Filing fee. What's that? Get paid in the Whatever. That's, 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 that's the cover charge for getting into the club, which is the courthouse. Okay, so uh, we've talked about, uh, and then what about this? What was this? Something about filing forms or something like that? What's that? Civil case initiation form. A civil case, a civil action cover sheet. Is that a typical name yeah. for that? It's a civil case right. initiation. Can somebody explain to me what a civil case initiation sheet has in it? What sort of general information? The type of case you're dealing with, with breach of contract, tort, things of that nature. The okay. Parties' names. Parties name, parties. name. It, it has the parties' names. It has a check check box. That, that gives you an option of the type, general type of case it is. Uh, does it have any spot for the attorneys? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, does it have anything in there about uh, related lawsuits or, yeah. or to the one on that's the, Depends on the court. Depends yeah. what form you're using and what court. Depends on the court, okay. Yeah. And what would, what would be the purpose for a related lawsuits question if it was on the civil action cover sheet? To sign a judge. Okay, so the judge, if it's very similar facts, same parties. It might be assigned to the same judge. Okay, basically that form, you just have to know that it has it and that you have to have it and it actually is required in the Civil Practice Act. So, uh, and it's self-explanatory because it's a fill in the blank form. Now, uh, what about a summons? What is a summons? Anybody know what a summons is? Required. You're ordered to appear and respond. It's a yes. It's a order from the court that the defendant has to appear and respond to the complaint. And why is that necessary? Because the rule says required to be served with the complaint. That's exactly right. And there's a case uh, which is Bank South versus Stamps. Uh, 221 Georgia Appeals 406, 1996, 
which says that if the summons is not served with the complaint, then the defendant has no juris the court has no personal jurisdiction over the defendant. And so, in order for the court to have personal jurisdiction over the defendant, the summons has to be served. And basically, if a, if a summons isn't issued by the court in connection with a complaint, then there's no civil action pending. And your whole goal here is to start a civil action on behalf of James Smith. Uh, so, Henry, I don't know if you want to get to this level of detail in the statute of limitations, though, but I mean, say you're running against the clock and you only got half an hour, and for some reason you can't get the summons. Um, is there a case saying that you can't, you don't beat the statute if you just file the complaint and you don't get the summons issued that day? Or can you wait a couple of days to get the summons issued? That I don't know, but I'm going to bank on getting the summons. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 9, 9 11 3 says a civil action is commenced upon the filing of the complaint, and then you have five days in order to make service. So get the damn complaint filed, worry about the summons later. Okay. Mickey Ross says, get the podcast <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm convinced you should do whatever you can to beat the statute of limitations. But don't forget about the summons right. before you serve. Five days, then it relates back to the day of filing the complaint. Okay, very good. For those of you on camera, the summons will relate back to the day of the filing of the complaint. If, if so, you serve within five within days. Five days. If you that, serve within that's five. That's the critical if. Okay. Because if you don't get it served within five days, then you go to the reasonable efforts rule. Mm -hmm. And there are cases that have held that if you don't get service within 30 days sometimes, it depends on how much effort you put in to find the defendant and give them serve. But uh, if you really haven't done anything in 30 to 45 days runs, you could find yourself because the statute of limitations isn't actually satisfied or told until the defendant is served. So the five-day relation back rule is automatic if you get them served within five days. Thereafter, you're into a, a, a test of reasonableness. And so, as a practical matter, what you got to do is to make is to document your efforts day by day as to what you're doing to track down and get the defendant served. And if you just give it to the sh uh, sheriff's department to get them served, good luck. <laughs> because you can't get a sheriff to testify regarding what they did. Uh, most of the time, right? I mean, because that's something they did in, in the course of their governmental duties. And it, it'll just get thrown in the process of the, you know, the chain of things being done in the sheriff's department, and it could be two months before they get around to really trying to serve them. And suppose they don't find them at that time, then then you got real problems. Another practical tip: if you're up against the statute of limitations, don't resort to asking the other side to waive service of process, because that's probably not going to constitute due diligence. Right. Or what about those situations where you've got a party who's trying to evade service? Well, that will play in your favor in terms yeah. of your reasonable efforts. Yeah. Yeah. But but what you got to do is you've got to document because ultimately it's your burden to you, you, it's your burden to show. So you know your paralegal, whoever's doing this, has got to keep records and ultimately do an affidavit mm -hmm. that they tried on day one, day two, day three, day four, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and everything they did to try to get service. Thank you. I mean. The it's things like that that, is, that are exactly what I want to come out in these uh, these topics of discussion, because these are the things that can prevent us from having malpractice problems. It gives us the opportunity to serve our clients the best we possibly can. In a circumstance like this, all you can do is all you can do, but you certainly don't want to just assume things are happening if you actually have the ability to make things happen. <coughs> so, uh, what has to be on a summons? Name of the parties, plaintiff and defendant, and then the person you're actually wanting to serve with that summons. Okay, name of the parties, plaintiff and defendant, and the person you actually want served with that summons. If you got multiple defendants, you have to actually get the summons with the name of the correct person to the person who you're serving. If you got five defendants and you serve summons for per defendant A on defendant D, then defendant D hasn't been summoned to answer the complaint. So in this instance, we just have one defendant, but that is a practical thing you need to remember is make sure that the summons and the copy of the complaint is served to the correct defendant. And so the, and the summons must state who that 
defendant is to be served. And it must be signed by the clerk of court. Uh, and, even right. and the clerk of court has to sign it. It's actually in the Civil Practice Act. That's the only time that a summons is issued is when the clerk signs it and she's actually sort of signing on behalf of the judges of the court ordering that the defendant uh, serve and file an answer. And aren't there additional fees for additional uh, defendants or plaintiffs in the case? Some counties. Mm -hmm. and some of the counties. Yes, so that we were talking about the filing fee earlier, always call in advance to find out, tell them exactly how many defendants there are, how many plaintiffs there are, whether you're going to be causing a private process server to serve the, the, the process or whether the sheriff is going to do it because they will charge you separately. Last thing you want to do is have all your papers ready, run over to the courthouse at 459, p.m. and then be short five dollars because in that instance who is king you or the clerk <laughs> in fact one of the things that all of you need to remember is the clerk is always the king uh, uh, I, just an example i had a I had a motion for summary judgment response the day before the hearing i was able to get extra testimony from a witness who was going to raise a, a genuine issue of material fact and the the clerk uh, the, had the original signature on the last page of the affidavit, but the top page was a faxed page of the document. And the clerk told me it was unconstitutional to file a faxed affidavit. Uh, and the clerk was going to win until I went to the judge and had the clerk overruled. But basically, if the clerk rejects you at 5, 459, then you've got a whole different problem on your hands. So I would say take some cash with you to fill in whatever gaps you need with respect to the filing fee. Uh, make sure that it happens. Also, uh, if there's any sort of issue regarding anywhere near being a statute of limitations problem, either you personally, the lawyer, go over there and file it or send your most trusted paralegal. Do not call a courier or somebody that has no, uh, you know, dog in the in the fight to go over there and file it for you all right now where does where does john doe live well john doe lives in hayhira county so you got to be in the county of john doe's residence unless you got a venue provision right and the note is what you're referring yeah. unless it's agreed to separate venue so we actually are going to cover venue, but your uh, FOI is correct. You want to sue in the correct in the correct county. Uh, now, if you only have one option and it's 3 p.m. and you have to file somewhere, you might conceivably get away filing in the wrong county because of the venue transfer rules, but yeah. Yeah. don't do it if you don't have to. Uh, all right, so we've got the summons. We've got the civil action cover sheet. Now we're going to talk about the thing that everybody else in the world besides us before this class thinks uh, starts a lawsuit, which is a what? Complaint. Uh, and uh, you might find that the Civil Practice Act has something to say about what has to be in a complaint. Now, uh, let me give you a sample complaint. Listen carefully. It's not too long. This is the complaint you have prepared. <laughs> And it's now 3.30. Uh, and Tim, I believe they're asking for you. <laughs> uh, all right, listen up. Jane Smith, uh, we got a style on there. It says Jane Smith versus John Doe. It's got the correct court listed at the top. And this is the paragraph one. Jane Smith loaned John Doe $10,000 on a note due December 14th, 2005. John Smith has not paid and Jane Smith demanded payment. Typewritten on the bottom of the complaint, it says, Henry Quillian, 1600 Parkwood Circle, Atlanta, Georgia, 30339. Okay, what does the complaint have that's required in the Civil Practice Act? Short, plain statement of facts to give them the basis for the claim. Okay. Short, short statement of facts, giving the basis for the claim. What else does it have? Correct case number. 
correct case, case style, which is the first thing I mentioned. Parties. It's got the parties. It's got the attorney's name and signature. It's signed by the attorney. Well, it's got the typewritten name and the address of the attorney. Well, presuming that you're going to sign it. Well, you can't presume anything. <laughs> uh, what, uh, you're the quality control person, and uh, you want to get out of the, you want to get the lawsuit right, right? So it's got it's got the name and the address typewritten on it. it does it does there it has, it does there need to be any other information down there with the attorney's name other than the name and the address? Signature. Uh, I challenge you to find in the Civil Practice Act where it says the bar number has to be on the complaint. But there's always right. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is you're right. It's Uniform Superior Court Rule 4.2 subsection 3 regarding entry of appearances. When you take on representation of a client, you have to make an entry of appearance with the court and the filing of a pleading is one opportunity to make an entry of appearance and Uniform Superior Court Rule 4.2 subsection 3 requires that the bar number and the, of the attorney and the phone number be on there as well as the address. Does the fax number have to be on there? No. No is the answer. Correct. What about the email address? Not yet. <laughs> All, right. All right. State and Superior Court, but no email address. Okay. Now, uh, what is what is missing in this complaint? Allegations of jurisdiction and venue. All right. Allegation of jurisdiction. Why do you have to have that in there? You got to establish you have a right to be in that courthouse. Well, and that court has jurisdiction over the person you're suing. Are you asking? Do you have to allege you jurisdiction if you're fine? Excuse me. Asking what do you need for the complaint to be accepted or to survive a motion to dismiss? I'm asking what does the Civil Practice Act require you to have in a complaint? Okay. Uh, you need a prayer for relief. I don't, uh, I don't think it was a prayer for relief. Then. Great. Uh, there has to be a demand for judgment. That's not OCJ 9118A to B. Uh, that's one of the two things that are listed as being the substance of the complaints. Well, one of two things that are listed as being the substance of the complaint. All right, now, do we have to allege jurisdiction of the court? Not the state court, yeah. All right, do we have to allege anything else relating to jurisdiction or venue? Constitutionally, personal, don't you? For personal jurisdiction and venue purposes? I mean, Bingo. for the issue of the... <laughs> 9118A2 <laughs> specifically says you have to allege facts supporting venue. And I have, in fact, gotten lawsuits dismissed because the plaintiff just said Jane Doe is owed money, uh, Jane Smith is owed money from John Doe, and it didn't say John Doe lives in at this address in this county. You have an alleged venue, and the and the defendant and the plaintiff never corrects that allegation. The complaint is deficient as set forth in the Civil Practice Act. I'm not saying that all courts would dismiss that one. I'm just saying I've successfully gotten a case dismissed because the plaintiff failed to allege facts to support venue, and that's because of the constitutional provisions in the Georgia Constitution that require that venue be in the county where the defendant is located. That's right. Uh, unlike in some states, venue is constitutionally mandated in Georgia. And so the Civil Practice Act, at one time the legislature was smart enough to actually put in constitutionally required things in the uh, Civil Practice Act. So that's one reason why it's written there, right there in front of your eyes. To when in doubt, you read the rules. Read the rules. Okay. All right. Uh, <coughs> So when I was a brand new associate, the first week of practice, my uh, senior partner brought in a complaint about 65 pages long, drops it on my desk, has every statute known to man cited in it, and he says, tell me whether it states a cause of action and whether we can move to dismiss this complaint. Turns out it was a fascinating complaint. It was a man who was, uh, 
incarcerated and uh, his contention was that the defendant parties, which is a very wealthy family, had jiffy quicked him into jail using a Title 15 communication station that controlled the FBI and the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, like I said, every statute known to man cited in that, in that complaint. And of course, dutifully, knowing the, the rules of civil procedure I had well so learned in law school, I went reading all those statutes to see whether he had stated enough facts to state a cause of action. But we ended up filing a two-page motion to dismiss this complaint. What, did we, what, what might have been missing from the complaint that allowed us to file that motion to dismiss without having to address all those statutes? Prayer for relief. Could have been a prayer for relief. Even simpler than that. I think April knows. He didn't sign the complaint. And 9-11-11 uh, specifically requires that if you're, if you're an attorney representing a party, you have to sign the complaint. And what else does it say about what you've done with that complaint before you sign it? That you've read it and you understand it's not interposed for delay. That applies to all pleadings attorneys sign. Which means what if you're an attorney? Can you just tell your secretary, type that up and sign it for me and get it on file? Are we in agreement? Is it no? Uh, so if you get a complaint that's been signed by somebody other than an attorney, you might question whether it's actually a properly lodged complaint. Is that a 12B1 or a 12B6 motion? This is a, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a 12B6, you just exhausted your 12B6 motion. In other words, if you, well, we'll, we will cover defenses, but what you're worried about is waiving other yeah. defenses if by filing do. an initial 12B6 motion. Correct. Uh, and so, uh, in federal court, you can get dismissal under Rule 11. So maybe you can. Under Rule 11, you can? In federal court, I don't know about yeah. this, but that what would be one thing to look at. Sanction under Rule 11. And uh, that happened to actually be a federal court case. I was just converting it to state and <laughs> superior court. Case. And we did get it dismissed. Uh, okay. So. Your, your, your complaint is going to act as an entry of appearance and it's going to provide to the court and eventually to the opposing party who is served all the information that is necessary for uh, them to get back in touch with you and to serve an answer on you. Okay. Um, so I've got a question here that I've never understood. I don't know what the answer is. Does it, is it a difference that makes a difference to make an allegation based on information and belief? I mean, does that phrase add anything whatsoever to pleadings? Are you asking, asking if, you if, if, if a pleading just merely says, upon information and belief, a note was executed on this day? What is the purpose of putting that phrase in a pleading? As opposed to... Uh, what are the options? Limit it, taking now, the whole I, I paragraph out? I understood that everything you allege is necessarily on information and belief. And so when okay. you say expressly, I've often wondered, are you, is that, huh. is that intended to be a weasel phrase? Particularly when you do it for some paragraphs but not others. And I honestly don't know what it adds to a pleading. Particularly if you're concerned about sanctions. Are you protecting yourself? by putting that squirrely phrase in some allegations but not others? What is the fraud of I, 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 Yes, I can yeah. share what I believe on that. If it's a, if it's a uh, sworn complaint, certainly you, can't do that. you don't want to swear to something. Unbelievable. With, with, uh, you don't want to affirmatively state that something is true unless you know it is actually true. Okay? Right. Uh, that would be one aspect. Another aspect is you want to plead a critical element of a cause of action, but you don't know for certain that it happened, but you think you have enough good faith basis to go forward with a lawsuit in order to get discovery to find out whether the other side in fact did whatever they are alleged to have done. 
that would uh, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. In other words, I do think, to answer your question, I think upon information and belief is mostly put in there as a weasel. Uh, is weasel words so that somebody doesn't have to stay actually testifying a deposition. I know that exact same thing happened. Right, so that's that they're presented with a complaint that they verified later in their deposition. The other side can't beat them up and say, but it says in here, you said that this happened and blah, blah, on this date, but you didn't have all the facts. Also, what about for 9B in fraud? Like you brought that up, Ron, for, for especially for federal complaints and like securities complaints where you have you have to plead fraud with specificity, but you haven't, haven't engaged in any discovery yet. And that's why I put it in. When I have a fraud complaint and I don't have all the facts, but I have enough facts to get you through the door, and I have the, you know, the rule nine requirement that I plead with a certain level of specificity, I, I gotta put something in there so I can, you know, I'm gonna get a motion to dismiss that fraud count at some point. And so I need to have enough facts in there to at least, you know, appeal to a judge and say, hey, this is what we had at the moment, Your Honor. This is all I have. And so, upon the information, I know it sounds weaselly, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of playing for that, you know, hearing date when I do have to stand before the judge on that motion to dismiss that fraud count. Okay, let's go back for a moment to the foundation of what we're discussing here, uh, which is another Civil Practice Act requirement, OCGA 9119. Sub, sub paragraph B. It's called uh, pleading fraud with specificity. Does anybody have a basis uh, to discuss what that is? Yeah, you have to plead fraud with specificity because it's such a it's such a a serious thing to allege against someone else that the courts require you to come forward with a lot of facts. And if you don't come forward with a lot of facts, you're more subject you're subject to dismissal. Um, because, and and the, the premise is that you shouldn't go around accusing people of fraud if you don't really have a real, you know, well-reasoned basis for thinking that someone defrauded you. It's sort of almost like a, a catch-all against defamation because you can say whatever you want for the most part in a pleading that's not defamatory and so this is the way that the courts prevent people from being defamed. So that doesn't mean that you just say, I specifically believe they defrauded me. Right. It, 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 you have to actually lay out all the facts by which they did defraud you. Mm -hmm. exactly. And in this very specific, there's a lot of case law and very specific requirements about what you have to put in there depending on the type of cause of action, the type of fraud. Well, actually, the rule says uh, fraud, mistake, or condition of mind. So it, it's really a broader, um, broader requirement than just fraud. Well, no, it says condition of mind. Malice and knowledge and other conditions of mind may be for general. Right. So we got a debate going on here. <laughs> <laughs> what what does a verb generally even mean? Yeah. Well, I don't understand how you can fraud is, is singled out because you can, as I understand it, you can uh, allege for punitive damages, wanton, reckless, willful, and you don't have to put in all kinds of facts about that. You can seek bad faith attorney's fees by just saying bad faith covering the litigious <laughs> under the burden without putting the facts. So this notion that fraud is defamatory and all these other scurrilous allegations are not makes no sense to me. I, I, I think it was, to me, that it's in there to try and help defendants get you know, rid of uh, uh, frivolous fraud claims. Well, there are a lot of things in the Civil Practice Act that are helped in there to help defendants. Anybody else got any other examples of that? How about the pleading of medical malpractice? Yeah, all, yeah. All, 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 all medical malpractice, 9.1. Nine There's also a requirement in there if you do sue for malpractice. Uh, let me just ask you this. Can you get sanctioned for suing somebody for malpractice yep. just by filing a complaint? And how can you get sanctioned? Well, this is—I think this is a new provision in 9118. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, if you don't follow the requirements that are in 9118 specifically for malpractice, you can get sanctioned. And basically, those are what? Doc? Um, I'm not a malpractice lawyer, so I'm reading this for the first time. <laughs> well, uh, let, me, let me guess and see if I'm, you can tell me whether you think I'm right. Okay. Basically, somewhere along the way, the doctors, 
I'm, I'm convinced it's doctors. I doubt seriously it's engineers because they're not particularly assertive. Um, <laughs> put in there that if you're going to sue somebody for malpractice, you either you can say the damages are less than ten thousand dollars, or you can state that the damages are more than ten thousand dollars. But you can't say, uh, you know, the person's guilty of malpractice and they owe me a hundred million dollars. Uh, all you can say is they're less than ten thousand, or they're more than ten thousand. And I guess that's because I guess that's in order to not have on the record outrageous claims regarding huge damages that a professional has caused somebody. Uh, and that's 9-11-8. Uh, A to B. Uh, okay, so we got this statute of limitations issue, right? And A to B does apply only to medical malpractice, whereas 9-11-9.1 to all licensed okay. In that case, I'm sure it was the doctors that got it in there. <laughs> uh, so, I was around when it happened. And then, uh, what, what uh, Foy is talking about with respect to the other statute is if you're suing somebody, a whole list of people with professional credentials for malpractice, you actually have to have an expert affidavit from somebody who, is, who practices in practically their exact same field who has reviewed the file and will say that person did in fact commit malpractice. But luckily, Jane Smith doesn't have that problem. Uh, so, uh, what's the next thing that has to happen? Let's assume we go over to the clerk, we have the civil action cover sheet, we have the blank summons not yet issued, we have the complaint that's signed with all the information on it, we've added our demand for relief to the complaint that I previously drafted. We added in some facts relating to venue saying that uh, John Doe can be served at such and such address in Hayhira County, which is the county we're in. Uh, and uh, maybe even we have a copy of that note attached as an exhibit. Uh, and we have the filing fee, we've called up, we go over there, we file it 4.59 p.m. What, are we totally done with this? Don't have to ever have to worry about statute of limitations again. No, no, it's okay, sir. Okay, so we gotta get the person served, John Doe served with the, what do we have to serve him with? Summons, 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 summons. summons. That's summons and complaint. Yeah. Together, and that summons has to ha be issued by whom? The clerk. The clerk, and it's gotta have whose <coughs> name on it? As a defendant, person okay. And who's else? Who else has to have their name on there? The attorney. Attorney. And I, you, right? Right. And it has to have your address as well, right? Okay. So we go to the clerk, and the clerk says, "Well, the sheriff's on vacation this week. Uh, what are we going to do?" Motion to appoint private processor. You get Nancy. <laughs> yeah. Motion to appoint a private process server. And how do you go about doing that? Thank you, you have to identify a private process server first, right? Depends on what county you're in. Some, some courts have a standing yeah. order that says that certain, that have a list of certain process mm -hmm. servers right. are just standing, appoint, standing appointed. And if you use Fulton, you should be careful that's up for renewal. I think yeah. December here and some people <laughs> have it put in their renewals. So if you use somebody, you want to make sure that they got it for the next two-year cycle. Mm -hmm. But right. for net, you have to do that every single time. You have to do a motion to appoint a special process already. Okay, so let's sort of review. In some counties, there are people that are already pre-appointed by the court as being eligible to, to be a private process server, and they have a standing order that allows that to happen. In other counties, you can't use a pre-standing, a pre-existing list of people to serve at all. But in any county, you have to make sure the person that you want to use is still on the list, I guess is what Matthew was saying, and that they, uh, the order expires and that people have to reapply to have that uh, benefit of being able to serve as a process server. And uh, so if you do use a private process server, do you give everything to the clerk and leave it there? No. Mm -hmm. Who do you have to get a copy of the complaint and the original summons to? Process. Okay, and that is a person of what nature? 
Can it be 18 years or older? Can it be your paralegal? No. Can't Why can't it be your paralegal, Foy? You can't have an interest in the case. And you can't be a party. Can't be a party. So you can't get Jane Smith to serve mm -hmm. John Doe. Is that right? Correct. And, uh, you might also want to, add, you want to go down with multiple copies of your complaint. They're going to take the, the clerk's going to take the original. Okay, clerk's going to take their original, and they're going to keep a, I guess, a copy of the original summons in the file, but also give you a summons. What if the, uh, what if the person is in the county next door? Yeah. What is a second original complaint? It basically, it's a copy of the complaint that has second original stamped on the top. <laughs> it's, it's just that simple. Uh, but we'll stick, we'll stay within Hayhira County right now. Uh, uh, so, uh, is there any other requirement of this person? Let's assume they have no standing list of people. So you have to find your person and you have to present to the judge a request for an order for having to have this person specially appointed as a processor for this particular case. Is that right? Mm -hmm. We all in agreement on it? What other requirements are there for this person other than not being personally interested, not employed by the law firm, and not one of the parties? Not a felon. The judge has to sign the order. The judge has to sign the order. Speed 18 or older. 18 or older. I believe the person has to be a citizen of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. And Louise says not a convicted felon. Yeah. There Louise you. says not a convicted mm -hmm. felon. I have no idea. I know. So, I mean, it's in our affidavit. Why that to be in the order you present? We've had them rejected before because that wasn't in there. Yeah. Okay. So to repeat. We have had rejected before proposed orders for appointment of special process servers that do not have within the order a statement that the person is not a convicted felon. And, and that is because judges can be, they can decide whether they want to or not want to appoint a particular person. And apparently, somewhere along the way, those judge, that particular judge decided, I don't want to appoint any convicted felons as process servers, especially one convicted of what? Robbery. Uh, perjury. <laughs> perjury. <laughs> Perhaps. Because what does that person have to do? That, if that person... Because they're clearly charged, so you don't want them convicted of fraud, anything that... Yeah. That, that, that means right. one-third of our state legislature cannot serve as... <laughs> do you have to... Does the person have to pay their state taxes? I don't know. <laughs> the other, the other two thirds of the legislation. <laughs> okay. So, what does this person do? Let's assume you get you get all that done. You get your order. You have your copy of the summons and complaint. You give it to this person who is the process server. What does that person do? Hand, hand delivers preferably. To whom? To the defendant. Okay. Hand delivers what? Summons, summons, and summons, and summons and the complaint. Can they be two separate documents or they have to be attached? I think they, have to be attached. they have to be attached with each other. Now, I don't know exactly what attached means. I certainly get summons and complaints attached with a heavy binder clip, which I think would be considered to be attached. Uh, but the Civil Practice Act says attached, so don't have the person coming up and saying, yeah, here's a summons, here's the complaint. <laughs> Apparently that doesn't work. And, and if you're really shifty and you don't have any other defense, as a defense lawyer, you might ask, was the summons attached to the complaint? <laughs> might as well <laughs> come up with some, some way of defending your, your, your client. Uh, okay, so let's assume that uh, John Doe is a truck driver, and even though he lives and has his residence at such and such address in Hayhira County. Uh, process server goes every day and sits out in front of the house and John Doe doesn't show up. But that John Doe is married and has three children, one who's 18, one who's 12, and one who's six. Does the process server have any option as to what they might do in order to get this complaint served? Yeah. Serve, serve his wife, the 18-year-old child that resides in the house. Okay. At their dwelling. Okay, so a 
I take it the Civil Practice Act expressly says that you can serve somebody's wife with a complaint? Any adult who shares the residence. Okay, it doesn't say wife, right? Right. It says a person of suitable age and discretion residing therein at the abode of the defendant, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can have big disputes over whether somebody is of suitable age and discretion. Uh, but you would hope that somebody's wife is. <laughs> and, and you would hope that somebody's 18 year old, 18 year old uh, child is of suitable age and discretion. Well, what if that, what if that child is just visiting from college and lives uh, four fifths of the time in Minnesota? To reside in the house. Yeah. So, what does the process server actually need to do if they're serving somebody that could could live there or might not live there? We have to confirm yeah. that they live there. They ought to ask. Yeah, do you live here? Right. Okay. Now, does the go ahead. just on a personal note, I have a story about this. My dad was cleaning out his mother's house, moving her into a uh, uh, into a nursing home in South Georgia, and uh, the process server showed up to serve her with something and asked, do you live here? And he said, not for the past 30 years. I live in Atlanta. And the uh, sheriff handed him the complaint and said, tell your mother she's been served. <laughs> what a sweet guy. And so, <laughs> tell your mother I'm an idiot. And so mother had a defense, right? Yes. Now what happened, I mean, we, this is getting down the road, but if you don't follow up on that and check off these various things, what happened if the defendant just stealthily raises an affirmative defense that says there was insufficient service of process and you get to trial after preparing, spending a gazillion hours, and the defendant says, I move to dismiss, there's no service in this case. You're done. You're, 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 you're cooked. So it's very important as the plaintiff's attorney that you make sure that you've crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's with respect to service and you don't want to just presume that something is has been done you have to actually get some affirmative evidence now what about uh, if John Doe's actually at the house and the process server uh, goes to the door John Doe comes process server says are you John Doe he says yes I'm John Doe process server says, server says well here's the complaint John Doe says, I don't want the complaint, don't give it to me. And the process server just throws it on the ground and leaves. He's been served. He's been served. Mm -hmm. uh, here the vote says he's been served. Why is that? Because he acknowledged that he was who he was supposed to be, and he acknowledged that, you know, yeah. I mean, that he confirmed who he was and he was at home, and just saying, I don't want it, doesn't mean you can't get served. Does there have to be any physical touching between the complaint and the defendant? <laughs> That's a good question. We had something that come up you know, recently that was along these lines that was an issue um, where our process server saw somebody inside the house, shouted out at him, you've been served, and left the papers sitting on a table outside the house. But because he never actually spoke with the guy and confirmed that it was the right person, it was not good service. Well, sometimes they hide out in there too. They know they're about to be served, yeah. so they try and they won't come to the door even if you're in the doorbell. And so I've had process servers that just have to sit out there and wait until somebody leaves, and then like basically like tag them. Yeah, they, but they have to. Leave. They have to like speak with them and have them acknowledge Stop that they are who they say they are. <laughs> they're supposed to be. One of my favorite stories is uh, at a previous law firm, we had a client who was not paying us, and we decided to sue them, uh, sue this guy who was a, a buff guy, a uh, young single guy, and uh, yeah, he was dodging service. And uh, my partner hired a stripper and got her appointed as special process server and uh, managed to get the guy served at his favorite bar <laughs> by her. Uh, Snuggling up next to him and then panning him the complaint. The, uh, and we got and we got and we got paid. After three weeks so. of searching for the proper stripper. My partner that did it all. Eric. Just going back to your uh, hypothetical about raising a defense about improper service and then waiting until um, the trial to make a statement about it. Can't you waive? 
improper service by participating in uh -huh. in the um, in the case. Of course. That would be the subject of a subsequent. <laughs> I assign you. <laughs> I know you can waive certain things. I, if you raise it as an affirmative defense, I'm not sure at what point you you waive insufficient service of process. I think a lot of pre-trial courts actually have that once the court is going to sit down and talk about the issue that need to be tried in the pre-trial. Well, that would be true. Yeah. If you get to a pre-trial order and the court requires one, you can certainly be at jeopardy at that point in time. Yeah. Well, just like arbitration, even if you plead arbitration as a defense, but you proceed with the litigation, at some point you're deemed to have waived your arbitration defense. I would assume the same rationale would apply to the service process. I thought there was well, if you counterclaim, I'm pretty sure. Unless that would be it's the jurisdictional, yeah. that's, that's, that might be the issue. Well, arbitration, yeah. I would say arbitration jurisdiction too, so it's also going to be like 12B1, but I suppose it's not What was that answer about throwing the, throwing the summons and complaining the person? Is that permissible? Uh, I believe that if, if there is confirmation that that is the person the person has notice of the complaint they see it there there doesn't have to be actual physical touching I don't yeah, know if you heard Louise describe this case mm -hmm. where somebody just yelled at somebody inside the house and left it outside that was found to be insufficient I don't know the citation yeah, they the didn't case. ask the person who they, they were they right. Right. Who right they were they didn't actually interact with that person the process server I think if you get a good process server they know that they know what they have to do and they know that they have to wait and at least wait for someone to exit the dwelling or answer the door and then interact with that person and give it to them the really fun part about this idiot was that he was the clerk of court in Glen County for 20 years he's now a process server and doesn't know how to serve process <laughs> so that was fun the operative word is delivery the rule says by delivering a copy too okay so if you get into an argument about what is delivery, I think under your hypothetical that would be delivery. Mm -hmm. I have a case oh, where we're so representing a company and the company has an agent for service of process. They got the agent's name wrong in the summons. They served him with the summons and the complaint, but is the summons technically defective because they got the agent's name wrong? Even though they actually did serve the correct person. So like, did they get the registered agent's name wrong or did they get the name of the company where you over the process wrong? No, it's, it's an individual. His name is, I don't It's an individual who is the registered. His name is John Doe and instead they said, you know, Jim Doe. Okay. And they served John, John Doe, but his name on the summons as agent of service of process was wrong. All right. We want to take a vote on this. Is the process, if you serve the right person with a summons who is merely acting as agent for a corporation, uh, but the wrong name is on the summons for the individual who is the agent, but he actually gets served, let's take a vote. Is the corporation properly served? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to vote yeah. yes. Yeah. There's a rule. <laughs> when in doubt, read the rules. And what rule is there? I don't know what the rule is, but I know that I looked at it one time. <laughs> and I know that there, you can serve managers at particular places. Like if you go to like a branch of a bank or something, you get the manager on the duty, then that's on that particular branch or something. I don't know. But there is a rule. I don't know what it is. So actually, that's the other side of my when in doubt is if you're absolutely certain because of some faint memory, read the rule. Read the rule. I think E1, E1 is what uh, this would be 9114 E1. 9114 E1 talks about corporations and who's, who's authorized to be served. And it lists a broad range of individuals. And there's a bunch of notes. There's cases on it, too. So now how about this? Registered agent for a corporation. He's married. Let's make it a he for the moment. And the registered office is the house where he and his wife live. And the process server goes there, and Mr. Registered Agent is not there, but Mrs. Registered, registered Agent is. She's old enough. She's over 18 years. She lives in the house. Can you serve Mrs. Registered no, Agent? No. Well, why not? I thought we just talked to her. Because Mrs. Registered Agent has nothing to do with that corporation, is not a manager, is not a president, is not somebody who ordinarily would receive service of process on behalf of the corporation so 
Mrs. Registered Agent serving her with just like throwing it out the window while driving down the highway. <laughs> Doesn't do you any good. Right. We all have agreement on that. Yeah. So if you're serving a corporation by way of serving the registered agent, you actually have to get the person, not a representative of the person, who you're serving. Right. Otherwise, you have to serve uh, somebody who is actually an officer of the corporation and who you at least eventually can establish is of such a position at the corporation that they can properly receive service of process. Which may mean you have a little little litigation over whether your service is correct or not. What if you're serving the registered agent and the registered agent has an office, has a business office, but you don't get to the agent, but you get to the receptionist, and you leave it to the receptionist, the receptionist says, I'll take it for Joe Jones, who's the guy you're trying to serve. I'll accept it for Joe Jones. Is that, is that good service on the agent? No. no. We all in agreement that's not good service on the agent? I, I think it can I be. I think yeah. a registered agent can have a delegate, mm -hmm. a person delegated to accept service on their behalf. We, we had that issue when we were trying to serve the VP defendants. Yeah. Because a lot of, I mean, all these corporations, hundreds of them, we were trying to get them served in different states and even overseas. And a lot of them, the registered agent's not always there because it's actually an officer of the company running around doing his daily duties. And we ended up having them leave the paperwork with a receptionist. Yeah, if the they receptionist were accepting it works for, for the defendant, correct. then that's okay. Yeah. If it's your registered agent is a different company. Correct, not just the a random question. receptionist. For what if the receptionist is just lying? She's not a does she, yeah. she doesn't do anything for this guy. She, she's, a, she's the receptionist at the beginning, at the front of the office, but she actually can't and is not authorized to do anything on behalf of that person. That's the problem. Is how do you prove it? I've, right. I've, I've lost that argument before. Okay. <laughs> Ron has a question. We get similar paradigms that happen with Atlanta Braves all the time. Which if they want to serve a player, or serve the executive, and they're walking to the executive suite, and they'll drop it at the receptionist desk and say, "You've been served," and we don't treat that service at all. So. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's so it's a really it's a fact issue depending on how that registered agent conducts his or her business. Is, is that what it comes down to? Whether that I, registered agent has delegated to people in the office to accept for him. Or not. I think it does, but yes, I think it becomes a fact issue. I think you'd either have to clarify it and get an admission, right. or cross-examine and get some judge to rule that service is actually taken. Isn't that the situation because, where, say, one of us is a, a registered agent for a client? And they get served and give the papers to Catherine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, but Catherine mm -hmm. will tell them I'm not accepting service. Because Catherine's got training properly. She, <laughs> <laughs> she, she will tell them. You have this client. You, you, know, you need right. training at your reception. Right. 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 Not think, anyone can accept service here. I right. think as a general rule, though, the firm does not want any of us to be a registry agent. On it hasn't happened here. It happens in our malpractice carrier. Mm -hmm. That's a malpractice issue, and I think it jeopardizes our malpractice and coverage. So we're not supposed to to do that. Okay, why does it even matter if somebody gets a copy of someone's complaint? It's already been filed. Well, that's the, that's the notice and due process requirements under the Constitution. Okay, so the Constitution requires, in order for you to be a defendant in a lawsuit and ultimately have a judgment rendered against you, that you're supposed to have notice of the lawsuit and an opportunity to respond and defend yourself. Right. And the only way you can, well, the Civil Practice Act sets forth ways that the legislature has determined are reasonable ways by which individuals and companies uh, can get notice that are satisfactory to uh, meet the requirements of the rules. Uh, now, I think what we will probably do is terminate this session because I sort of committed that we would try to keep it to exactly an hour. Next time we will pick up alternative and uh, more extraneous ways by which service of process might be obtained and then further move into uh, decisions about whether or not you should have discovery with your complaint if you have more than two hours to prepare your pleadings, <laughs> uh, strategy decisions like that, not too much in detail and then we'll talk about answering, moving to this myth, otherwise responding to a complaint that's been uh, received. And this is exactly what I hoped would happen, that we'd have lots of participation, lots of input from people, lots of questions. So thank you. Good job.